Good evening and uh, welcome to the uh, Baker Institute. Uh, as many of you know, the Baker Institute's purpose is to bridge the world of ideas and action. And Jose Antonio Ocampo, this year's Clayton Fellow in International Economics, is one of those rare persons in public life who has earned genuine distinction in both the academic worlds and the world of uh, practitioners. Uh, after receiving his Ph.D. Uh, in economics and sociology from Yale University in 1976, Professor Ocampo, a native of Colombia, held academic appointments, <coughs> my Spanish is terrible, the Universidad de los Andes, don't laugh, uh, but I'm trying, and the uh, Universidad Nacional de Colombia. He also occupied a number of high posts in the Colombian government, including Minister of Finance and Minister of Agriculture. So we have to call him His Excellency. Along the way, he served as visiting professor at some of the greatest universities in the world, including Oxford, Cambridge, and, as I said, Yale. In 2003, he became the United Nations Undersecretary for Social and Economic Affairs, a position he has held until last year when we approached him to become the Clayton Fellow at the Baker Institute. Currently, he is a professor at the Institute of Economic Research and Policy at Columbia University, where he is also co-president with Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz of the Initiative for Policy uh, Dialogue. Professor Ocampo has published widely on international financial and monetary issues, international trade, and Colombian economic history. He's always been interested in subjects that interest and intersect academic economics and public policy. He has focused in recent years on a Washington consensus, promoting free markets and free trade, and their impact on economic growth in Latin America. He is wi widely known for his work on ways that developing countries can reduce their exposure to international financial volatility an issue that is, of course, very current today. In recognition of his significant contributions as an economist, Tufts University's Global Development and Environmental Institute announced in February that Professor Ocampo had been selected as the 2008 winner of its prestigious Leon Tief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. He joins as recipient of this honor, among others, John Kenneth Galbraith and Amartya Sen. The position of the Clayton Fellow, which he holds at the Baker Institute, was established by a very generous gift from the Clayton family in 1998. We are very fortunate to have Will Garwood and his lovely wife with us tonight, the members of the Clayton family. Uh, this fellowship honors Will Clayton, who was the principal architect of the Marshall Plan, one of the greatest foreign policy, in my view, triumphs uh, in our history. And this fellowship does this by promoting research at the Baker Institute at Rice University on the key role of international economics and economic development and the role they play in global affairs. Uh, <laughs> the, the way we even thought of the Clayton Fellowship was rather accidental. I was on my way to Bush International Airport after Francoise and I got here in 1995, 1994, and I noticed the Will Clayton Freeway. You turn off the Will Clayton Freeway to go to the airport. And I said to myself, what in God's name is Will Clayton's name on a freeway here in Houston? Never, never making the connection that Will Clayton was a son of Houston and a very prominent one. I had learned about Will Clayton when I was working for my first mentor at the Foreign Service, George W. Ball, in the State Department, and he was the one who introduced me to Will Clayton's role as the architect and conceptual, well, the conceptual architect of the Marshall Plan. So when I got back to Houston, I did some research and met Will Garwood, and that's how it all started. So I can think of no more worthy recipient of this fellowship than Jose Antonio Campo, who will speak tonight on Latin America, the boom and the current turmoil. Join me in welcoming Professor Ocampo to the podium.
Okay, thank you, Ambassador, for uh, that uh, extremely generous uh, introduction. And uh, let me say that I'm very happy to be here. Um, I appreciate very much uh, this association with uh, the Baker Institute, the Rice University. And uh, I must say the, the fact that uh, uh, the name uh, of the person behind this uh, 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 special uh, position uh, is uh, also uh, the father of the Marshall Plan uh, makes, uh, I think, a, particularly, uh, a particular honor to be. So thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Now, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, to go in my presentation um, uh, through an analysis of you know, what has been going on in Latin America and, and thinking uh, about uh, the situation that, that uh, we're undergoing during this, uh, well, what is uh, clearly uh, uh, an important financial crisis in the United States uh, that has continued to deepen and we, uh, it's quite clear that we have not reached a bottom and, and the effects on the world economy are still to be known. Um, uh, so uh, it's interesting, I mean, uh, as we will see, the, the last four years have actually been exceptionally good in Latin America. Um, this is a, just a, 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 a presentation. You see, the, uh, the last four years, uh, growth in Latin America has been uh, close to 6% per year. Um, uh, and uh, when you look back in history, uh, actually the only period that is similar in terms of growth uh, is 1967-1974. I mean, I have been broken down the history since 1950 in short periods. And you see that, you know, the, the only levels uh, of growth of the order of 6% per year was, uh, was back uh, three decades ago. So this is really an exceptional uh, circumstance. I, I must say that the fact that uh, uh, the, the two largest economies, uh, uh, Brazil and, and Mexico, have actually not done as well as they did then, uh, makes it this more remarkable because it means that the rest of Latin America, the other 16 nations that uh, we add up, have actually been doing better than they did uh, at that time. Uh, I mean, it's a good question. Probably uh, I'm, I'm going to try to answer uh, why you know, it, it is the largest economies, which actually were booming in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, but not they're do, doing particularly poorly uh, in recent years. I mean, why is that is so? It's, it's an interesting uh, question, but I, I don't probably have the full answer. Now, why is this? Uh, and my answer is, well, we have been living through really exceptional conditions. High commodity prices, and, and commodity prices are particularly important in Latin America, as we will see at the end. Uh, because uh, we continue to be uh, highly dependent, with very few exceptions, on commodities uh, for our exports. Uh, the second is uh, the mix with very favorable conditions in international financial markets. Uh, that coincidence of booming commodities with good financing uh, has always been uh, a recipe for very rapid growth in Latin America. So the, the current uh, uh, conjuncture that we have been living through the last four years is no exception to that rule. And then on top of that, we have a third factor which was not present in the past and which has been very important, particularly for small economies, uh, which is uh, high levels of remittances uh, from uh, migrants abroad, okay? So let's see the numbers for this uh, to see the, uh, uh, this, is, um, this is the story of commodity prices. Now, uh, so uh, uh, how uh, so this goes back again to 1945 to see how high commodity prices are in historical uh, perspective, uh, uh, and this, these are uh, compared to, uh, to uh, prices of manufacturers. So they are the real price of commodities in terms of their purchasing power, uh, in terms of manufacturers. And, and what we see is that uh, the, the red bars refer to metals. Uh, so uh, while the, the green are the agricultural goods, okay? So what this shows is something interesting. I, particularly, let, let me show the, uh, I mean the, the dark or light blue. The, what happened in, in commodity prices 
is that the 1980s, I don't know if this, I don't know why this doesn't seem to, but anyway, the 1980s and the 1990s were periods of very, uh, of falling commodity prices. Um, it's not, it doesn't seem to be powerful enough to. <laughs> anyway, the, the 80s and 90s uh, were period of falling commodity prices in general, but particularly of agricultural prices. And uh, what has happened recently in those cases, as you see the blue uh, bars, uh, is, uh, excuse me, the, the green bars, is that the uh, prices have returned, have increased, but in the case of agricultural goods, we have simply gone back to the levels that we had in the 1970s and 1980s. So the boom is really exceptional, it's for minerals, not for agricultural goods, okay? And, and that you can see in the red bar, uh, which are metals. See, on average, uh, metal prices last year were twice the level uh, of the, uh, the post-world period. So it's a very exceptional level. And then, of course, if you put oil, it's even uh, more impressive because oil was more than five times uh, the real price that they had in the, uh, in the historical period. So it uh, said commodities uh, are, uh, uh, I mean, the commodity boom is primarily a mineral boom. Uh, more than an agricultural boom. And that is clearly reflected in Latin America. So the, the, the countries that have experienced the, the uh, uh, strongest improvement in the terms of trade, international terms of trade, are, uh, well, uh, Chile, an exporter of copper and, and Venezuela, oil, uh, followed by, uh, uh, followed by, okay, uh, uh, followed by uh, uh, Ecuador, Peru, uh, uh, Bolivia, uh, and Colombia, uh, which uh, in interestingly is today more a mineral exporter than a cultural exporter, contrary to the common wisdom, uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, the, ex uh, the export goods that have boomed in Colombia uh, are coal, oil, uh, nickel, and gold. So that they, and they represent more than half of exports uh, now of Colombia. So it is basically the mineral economies that have been experiencing uh, the most impressive uh, boom. Okay, and this is the situation uh, of, uh, of international finance. Uh, what I have here is uh, the, the risk uh, premium, what well, you have to pay over the U.S. Treasury rates uh, uh, when, uh, you know, Latin American country borrows in international markets. And what you see here is uh, that somewhere in, the in 2004, uh, this uh, premium uh, actually uh, came below the level prior to the Asian crisis. So there have been, a, a, and we'll see at the end another graph of this sort. Uh, so financing had been very costly uh, for several years since the Asian crisis, uh, in 1998 to 2003. You know, financing was very costly. Uh, and then it started to recover uh, uh, and, uh, and became cheaper. You see, here you see the cheaper part uh, of the uh, financing, and here you see the booming part of financing in red line. These are capital flows to Latin America. And you see particularly this uh, boom that took place actually between the middle of 2006 and the middle of 2007 it was quite, quite impressive. Uh, actually, during those periods, Latin America uh, received uh, $100 uh, billion dollars in uh, external financing, uh, uh, which is uh, a, a record level. Uh, no, I mean, there, there was no, nothing of that kind uh, uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, and when, of, of course, some of the major effects of this uh, had been uh, the boom in the stock markets. So in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, dollar values, this shows the, the average uh, value of the stock market uh, in uh, the seven major Latin American economies, uh, which uh, basically multiply by uh, uh, over four uh, in, uh, during this uh, recent boom, okay? And finally, uh, the story of remittances. Uh, actually, remittances uh, went up before the crisis, but then remained relatively high uh, uh, as a proportion of the economies. Uh, uh, and this is interesting, um, you know, perhaps a, a point that has not been made in relation to the migration debate in the United States, is that uh, the fact that the, uh, the increase 
in remittances took place in the late uh, 90s and early part of this decade uh, probably shows that uh, there was an expulsion factor associated to Latin American crisis then uh, that led to so much migration uh, out of Latin America. And, uh, and that the, in recent years, uh, you know, the, the, that they say that push factor, as it's called generally, uh, ceased to be probably as important precisely because uh, we will see uh, the boom allowed uh, the creation of much, uh, of lots of employment uh, in Latin America. So that the, the, the Latin American labor market has been much better able to absorb uh, its labor supply. Now, what are the, uh, the, in terms of economic policies, what are the, you know, some of the major developments? Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, go really briefly some, some of them and don't get deeply to, actually to analyze uh, probably the effects and, and the questions regarding the future, which I probably find more, in, more interesting. Uh, one feature uh, uh, which is quite important is the, the uh, high levels of taxation of minerals and, hi and hydrocarbons. Uh, so the, the fact that these uh, commodities have had exceptional prices uh, has led many governments to try to tax them more heavily and to get more return uh, out of, the, of those natural resources. And this is a feature that, you know, of course, uh, co governments like Venezuela have been particularly active. Uh, but it's actually also Chile, which uh, actually uh, for the first time established a, a, a direct tax on copper production. Uh, which was absent uh, uh, before the, uh, uh, the, the, the boom. A second interesting phenomenon uh, I find is de-dollarization de uh, of, uh, of several economies. Um, uh, back a decade ago, there was a, a lot of uh, push to, you know, for Latin American economies to dollarize, and some did, uh, El Salvador and Ecuador, um, uh, which uh, together with Panama are the three uh, fully dollarized Latin American economies now. But there was a lot of pressure for other economies, including Argentina, to, to dollarize. Uh, now the, there is a recognition that that's probably not positive for, for a developing country, uh, and it has been the opposite trend, and, and there has been a lot of uh, action by highly dollarized economies in terms of their financial system to, to reduce the importance of dollar uh, financial transactions. Uh, that's important, for instance, in Peru, uh, it's important in Bolivia, it's important in Uruguay, uh, which are, you know, in very uh, dollarized uh, financial uh, economies. Now, one issue and a, uh, which uh, I will uh, summarize in the following way, one of the characteristics of, of, uh, of these uh, cycles that, uh, that originate in the financial uh, uh, area is that most of the... Uh, or the changes in, uh, in demand uh, that are, take place during the crisis take place uh, due to the private sector more than the public sector. And what basically happens is that uh, during uh, good times, there is a lot of credit, and that leads to more private spending, uh, while uh, when the crisis comes, there is the, the, dual, the, double, the dual effect of reduced uh, financing for the private sector uh, as well uh, as, uh, of course, the more difficult situation of, you know, private companies that go into bankruptcy. So it is the private sector that, uh, has, to, that has the strongest swings, cyclical swings. And we will see that uh, uh, graphically in, in a few minutes. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the public sector uh, has been booming because of, uh, particularly of high levels of taxation. So we will see that the, uh, in, the, in the graph that, that the private accounts, uh, excuse me, the public sector accounts have generally improved in Latin America, but that's not a, uh, a sign that there is, a, let's say, uh, a austerity in, uh, in public sector spending. Actually, with the exception of Chile and Peru, uh, most governments have actually increased significantly uh, public sector spending in recent years. Uh, and furthermore, I would say the, uh, 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 although th there is uh, now a very uh, well-established, uh, uh, let's say, fiscal conservatism, uh, is th there is at the same time uh, the belief that the public sector has to play, uh, again, uh, an increasing role uh, in the economy, particularly uh, in the area of social spending. Uh, uh, and, and, and finally, and very interestingly, uh, uh, there has been, uh, due to the, uh, the flood of money, particularly a flood of capital that took place uh, since 2006, 
Uh, there has been a, a lot, a massive interventions uh, by the central banks in the foreign exchange markets, basically uh, to accumulate international reserves. Uh, so th rather than allowing the exchange rates to fully uh, uh, you know, uh, appreciate to absorb the increasing amounts of capital, what central banks have done is trying to absorb part of the surplus in foreign exchange. So, you know, we can see here, you know, the, um, the uh, story, the, the blue line has what happens with the private sector uh, balance. I mean, the difference between, let's say, between savings and investment of the public or between spending and uh, income uh, of the and what you see is that it, what happens during a crisis is that it, most of the adjustment has to be done by the private sector, okay? So the private sector in Latin America went to, from having a deficit of 2% of GDP to, uh, to having a surplus uh, as a result of the crunch generated by the crisis. And on the contrary, the boom has led to more private sector spending, so that, that surplus is actually declining uh, very rapidly, and we'll see the results. On the contrary, the, the public sector uh, was not able, despite the, the cuts in spending, to adjust during the previous crisis, uh, basically because of low levels of revenues. Uh, uh, and uh, it is during the boom uh, that the, the, private sect uh, the public sector has actually gone back into a fiscal balance. So Latin America has, on average, now a fiscal balance, which is a very unprecedented situation uh, historically. You see the both 2006 and 2007, uh, on average, the public sectors of Latin America were in balance. Now, this uh, shows the, uh, the credit booms. Uh, the credit booms have been particularly impressive in Brazil, in Colombia, but all of you know, all the other countries, with the exception of Peru, uh, have been experiencing a boom. And this is, as I said, one of the reasons why spending, uh, private sector spending is increasing very rapidly. And this is the story uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, of the public sector spending, and let's, I think we should concentrate on the blue lines here. Uh, so the, 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 the only country where spending has declined uh, is Chile, uh, relative to, I mean, and this is, of course, relative to, to GDP. That means that, that doesn't mean that you, in absolute terms, you cut the spending, but actually that the spending increases less, let's say, than the economy. But all the other countries, and most impressively, Venezuela, uh, have actually been uh, increasing uh, spending. So the, uh, the, so the, the fact that we, have, we are in balance is, not, is more a reflection of the booming uh, revenues, uh, including, as I said, the booming revenues from natural resources, uh, not, is it not uh, uh, a, they say a demonstration that uh, somehow uh, spending is uh, declining uh, in the public mm -hmm. sector. And this, uh, uh, and this graph uh, shows uh, uh, how much uh, international reserves um, uh, central banks have bought uh, during a periods of particular uh, abundance of foreign exchange. Uh, and if we concentrate on the red lines, the, which is uh, the period between July 2006 and June 2007, this is the period, um, uh, they say the year before the U.S. financial crisis. Uh, which was a period of, of booming capital inflows is the, the period in which we received this $100 billion uh, in capital flows. And you see that one of the, uh, the uh, major uh, uh, policy decisions at the time was to, uh, for, foreign, uh, for central banks to buy a, a large amount of that surplus of foreign exchange. Uh, and that's the red uh, bars here of, for each country. The only exception is Mexico, as you can see, uh, which actually did not have uh, so much abundance, but in, uh, in countries like uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and, and Peru, uh, these additional assets, uh, uh, international assets of central banks, increased between 7 and 9 percent of GDP. It's a massive, really massive intervention. I, I don't know in the case of the U.S. how much it would, that would mean, but you know, 7 percent of GDP uh, or 9 percent is a really massive intervention. I'll tell you, it's not common. Okay. Now, what have been the effects of the boom? Uh, the effects of the boom have uh, in general been extremely positive. Uh, we have a, a, a very high levels of investment, uh, a, a very uh, impressive improvement in debt, in external debt, um, uh, but uh, uh, with the deterioration uh, in the current account uh, of the balance of payments, so the surplus that uh, has 
has been generated by, particularly by booming commodity markets, uh, is now declining very rapidly. And in terms of uh, the social effects, we have had actually a very impressive uh, uh, results uh, in terms of uh, employment generation uh, and reduction in poverty. Uh, this is the story uh, of uh, investment. Um, so the investment rates, uh, as you see, uh, have increased very sharply, uh, in, you know, from uh, levels of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, slightly over 16% of GDP uh, to now 21% of GDP. You see that Latin America uh, has only uh, invested uh, levels like that uh, in the 1970s. But these levels of investment uh, were, again, highly concentrated in Brazil and Mexico. So if we did this graph without Brazil and Mexico, the current levels of investment will actually be better uh, than uh, the levels of the 1970s. So, you know, you ask the question, uh, can Latin America grow at you know, rates of 5 to 6% per year now uh, with, the with the current levels of investment? Uh, my answer is uh, probably yes. I mean, probably Latin America doesn't need much more than it's currently investing. Uh, the real problem here is to is really avoiding a downswing uh, of investment because you can see that every crisis there is a very sharp uh, reduction in investment rates. So the the uh, at the end of the day the the problem is not so much the levels of investment that but how to avoid a, a downswing. And this is the the uh, very impressive result in terms of debt. Uh, the fact that you know. A large part of the booming in external revenues has been used to reduce debt levels of every individual country. And then some countries, some of the poorest countries, have gotten debt relief from the IMF, the World Bank, etc. And the net result is that you know, the, you know, prior to the, to the, the boom, you know, the debt levels of Latin America in, uh, were over 40% of, uh, of, of, this, of the economy. Uh, now they are 20%. And if you, uh, in addition to that, net out the international reserves, which are international assets of the countries, uh, what you find out is that the current levels of net debt, of, uh, debt external debt of Latin America is, uh, are 8% of GDP. Nothing like this had happened for half a century. Okay, so this is the the, uh, the most important legacy in terms of the let's say of the strength of the economy uh, to face uh, let's say the crisis that will come. I mean, for a long time there was a lot of discussion of, about how to increase the resilience of the economies to financial turmoil. Uh, I said this is uh, probably the best uh, uh, advance in in that regard. Now. The negative side uh, of this is, is, however, the fact that, that uh, the, uh, say the, the current account surplus, I mean the, the surplus in the external accounts of the economies, uh, is coming to an end. Um, uh, uh, so what I do here is actually the red line is quite, you know, you see the uh, say deterioration where it's very fast. What I do here is to take out the effect of the boom in commodity prices, okay? And what I find is that, you know, when you take out the boom in commodity prices, the, the improvement in the terms of trade, uh, actually the uh, deterioration is very fast and the, the deficit, uh, the external deficit is actually, uh, okay, let's say, similar to that, that we had uh, before the previous crisis. Um, of course, I, I must say that uh, when you compare this with the levels of the U.S., it's, uh, it's quite impressive because the U.S. got to, you know, had in recent years 6% of GDP. In, uh, in, in uh, its current account deficit, you know, Latin America, even in its worst times, it has between three and four percent. Okay, so it's, uh, this shows that you know the U.S. Uh, of course has been able to live with very high levels of deficit for some time. It's now running into difficulties in that regard. Uh, the depreciation of the dollar is the, is the manifestation of that. But in Latin America, with much lower levels of deficit, we went into crisis generally. So, so this is uh, something I would say to, to wash out. Uh, 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 what it really means is that we have spent all the commodity boom, okay? So we have already uh, done that. So the margins that we have in case commodity prices fall, uh, which is a, a question mark, I will come back uh, to that, uh, are, you know, important. 
Well, and this is the situation uh, of employment. Uh, you see, the employment rates of Latin America uh, tended to, to fall. Uh, this is employment in red, excuse me. This should be up here because the, the, the blue here is unemployment, okay? Uh, so the, the red, which is employment, the, the employment levels uh, actually tended to decrease uh, relative to, this is relative to the population uh, uh, of working age, uh, so the population between 15 and 65 years. Uh, so the, the actually employment was very weak in Latin America uh, from 1990 to 2002. But you see here the very impressive recovery uh, of employment in recent years, uh, which has, of course, led to a decline, uh, a significant decline in unemployment rates, um, uh, two levels which are now uh, the lowest in two decades. And this is actually even more impressive, which is uh, what has happened in terms of poverty reduction. Uh, according to the, uh, uh, the statistics that the United Nations calculates for Latin America, uh, what we see here is that you know, between 1990 and 2002, there was a decline in poverty, but it was very slow, you know, like you know, two uh, to three percentage points in more than a decade, which is very low. On the contrary, in the last, uh, uh, actually in the last uh, uh, four years, uh, poverty rates have declined by nine percentage points. Uh, again, nothing like this uh, had been experienced uh, in, by Latin America since the 1970s. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, and, uh, and this is uh, furthermore, uh, the combination uh, of you know, booming economies uh, with uh, the first signs that the, there is an improvement in income distribution in several countries. Uh, which is again an unprecedented event. Uh, we don't know how uh, how uh, important it is, and, 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 and there is a lot of questions regarding why uh, this is taking place. But according to the statistics for recent years, uh, many of the major Latin American economies uh, have been experiencing a slight improvement in income distribution. That includes Brazil and Mexico, the two largest economies. It includes also uh, Chile, it includes Peru includes Venezuela, you know, among the, the major economies. Uh, Colombia and Argentina actually also show uh, an improvement in income distribution, uh, but in those two cases, it's actually a reversal of a, a very sharp worsening of income distribution that had taken place since 1990. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, well, for the other economies that I mentioned, uh, it's a net improvement. Uh, in I, I could come back to this probably in the question session. And so let me, um, let me finish uh, with uh, some reflections on, on how I see the, the effects of the current turmoil uh, and, the, and, the, you know, and the road ahead. And in this regard, uh, I will start by saying that the, uh, the, uh, the financial di uh, disturbances have had significant effects, uh, as we will see. I mean, the risk premia that we saw falling very rapidly have started to increase. Um, equally rapidly. Uh, this is also true uh, of uh, almost any financial instrument. Uh, it's certainly true of the uh, uh, financial instruments in the U.S. economy also. Uh, but what is interesting is that interest rates remain low. Uh, why do they remain low? Uh, essentially because uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, let's say, the payment on, on, a, on a foreign debt of a Latin American country uh, is essentially the uh, the uh, addition of two factors, which is the, the uh, interest rate on the U.S. Treasury bonds plus the risk premium. And what has happened is that the risk premium has increased, uh, but uh, the interest rates of the United States have fallen. Okay? So the, the two effects have more or less netted out, uh, and, the, uh, and the interest rates have continued to be at historically very low, as we will see. Uh, in fact, the, the most important short-term factor is rising inflation, uh, which is a worldwide phenomenon uh, associated to food inflation in recent years. And, uh, and the, the, what central banks can do in the face of food inflation is, uh, we can say, very limited. And, but one thing that they have done is to try at least to keep uh, interest rates high um, uh, while the uh, Federal Reserve has uh, as you know, significantly reduce interest rates. So the result of that is that the interest rate differentials between Latin America and the U.S. have actually increased sharply, 
Uh, and that's uh, one factor that has fed into the, uh, uh, in, in one particular way, which is the strong appreciation of several uh, Latin American uh, 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 countries. Now, in a longer term perspective, and this is probably the most interesting issue, uh, you know, despite the recent growth, uh, you know, rates of uh, productivity growth remain relatively low compared to historical standards. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we have done uh, very little in terms of diversification of exports uh, uh, out of uh, natural resource-based uh, 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 commodities and, and manufacturers. So uh, one interesting and final question, uh, uh, re it relates, in fact, to, to whether uh, uh, the, uh, the new conditions of the world economy uh, uh, give uh, more room for uh, uh, the possibility of uh, natural resource-based economies uh, to be uh, uh, using their natural resources for growth, uh, which has been a, a controversial issue for a long time. So this is the, uh, uh, this is the story uh, of the, the effects of, of the financial turmoil um, you know, we here have here the, uh, this is the basic risk premium of developing countries in, in, in blue. And uh, so this is the, uh, the summer turmoil in the United States. Uh, and what happened in, in, uh, during the summer turmoil, uh, uh, excuse me, the, 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 uh, the red are the exchange rates of, you know, the average exchange rate of Latin America, okay? So the, uh, what happened during the turmoil in the summer uh, was essentially that uh, the risk uh, of Latin American debt increased, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, and there was a, de a depreciation of the exchange rates of, of major countries. Now, in September, uh, things uh, normalized, and this is, uh, of course, the, the time when the Federal Reserve took the first decisions to to, to improve uh, conditions. So there was a, a significant improvement. But uh, uh, and actually, there was a, a flood of money to many developing countries uh, because at the time it was uh, regarded that maybe developing countries, because they have high international reserves, are actually safer than many U.S. assets. Okay, so uh, uh, so there was a, a reduction in risk premia and, and a flood of resources, which generated a, a, an appreciation of the exchange rates of Latin America. But this. Uh, uh, changed uh, uh, somewhere around November, and since November of last year, the the, the, uh, uh, the risk uh, has been increasing uh, uh, consistently. Okay, uh, but uh, still, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, the uh, exchange rates have appreciated, uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, because of the depreciation of the U.S. dollar. Okay. So you see by countries, actually, the phenomenon has been uh, quite uh, different. Um, uh, it, uh, but this is, I take as, as a point of comparison here, the first semester of 2007. And what you see that Brazil uh, and Chile has been the country that have been affected um, uh, 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 in a stronger way by the, uh, by the appreciation of the currencies. Uh, so that, you know, reflection of the inflows of capital that those countries have been, uh, have been getting. Uh, I said with the, this very peculiar situation that uh, uh, in, in the post-U.S. Uh, or during the U.S. financial crisis, actually many developing countries are seen as safer investments uh, than the U.S. itself, okay? Uh, and this is particularly Brazil, Chile, and to some extent uh, Colombia and Peru. Now, this increase in risk, uh, however, as I said, is compensated by the reduction if, in U.S. interest rates. So when, uh, what, when you estimate this, which is what you know, they call the yields in, in markets, um, it actually, you know, here the Latin and the uh, average, uh, uh, let's say, cost of debt uh, for a third world country. And, and it's quite impressive that, in fact, there has been very little increase uh, in, uh, in, uh, in recent uh, months. Uh, and the levels of, let's say, of cost of the debt, which is 7%, uh, are actually much lower than what you know, developing countries were used to. Uh, I mean, when you see here, the, this is the, uh, the pre-Asian crisis, uh, when the, the, say, the cost of debt was you know, 10 to 11%. But after the Asian crisis, uh, it was not on, on, uh, common to have 15 or 20% uh, in terms of debt, uh, cost of debt. So the, uh, despite the, the turmoil, uh, 
uh, financial conditions uh, remain relatively uh, good so, so far. So since commodities remain high um, and, uh, and interest rate remain low by historical standards, uh, let's say uh, Latin America on average has not been yet hit uh, by, the, uh, by the financial turmoil. Now, so the, the major uh, questions relate to, uh, to you know, the longer-term perspective. And what I do here is to calculate a very simple uh, productivity of labor for long periods of time. And what I have here is a comparison uh, of you know, 1990 to 2007. This you may call is the liberalization period of Latin America. Uh, what we used to grow uh, with more state intervention, which is 1950 to 19, 1980, okay? And, you know, all the countries that are above this line, this di diagonal line, uh, are countries that have done better in the recent period. Uh, all those that are below uh, have done worse, okay? And you see the countries that have done worse in a longer-term perspective are, more, are many more than the countries that have done better. Uh, in fact, only three countries have done better. Uh, uh, the two which are... Uh, best located at Chile and the Dominican Republic. In fact, the Dominican Republic has been the most dynamic economy of Latin America uh, in a long period, which is a fact that was usually ignored. <laughs> um, uh, Chile has usually mentioned as the most dynamic, but actually the Dominican Republic is slightly better than Chile. Um, uh, now, the other is Uruguay, but Uruguay actually did poorly in both periods, so it's not perhaps the, the best example, okay? But all the other economies, including some of the most important, are actually significantly below the line. And here, you see, you see, you have Brazil here, you have Mexico here. So, the, the, you know, in a, in a longer-term perspective, uh, these two large economies. But you have also have Colombia here, you, know, you have Venezuela, you know, you have uh, whatever Ecuador, Paraguay, etc. So, most economies uh, of Latin America still have a long way to recover. Uh, from a, a, a long period of low economic growth, uh, which preceded the, the current boom. So we have to be a, a, a bit cautious about, you know, the, I think the conditions have improved significantly in recent years. Uh, they have had significantly positive effects. Uh, but, you know, the longer-term perspective is still is uh, one of relatively low economic growth. And I end up with, with this graph, which uh, raises the question, uh, does uh, specialization in natural resources matter? And what this graph shows is uh, the proportion of, of exports made up uh, here is uh, commodities. And these are manufacturers uh, which are based on commodities. Uh, I mean, uh, these, of course, some, sometimes are, in, you know, a very sophisticated manufacturer. I mean, this includes, the, let's say, the wine production of Chile, let's say, or the sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, fruits or whatever of uh, several Latin American countries now. But what this shows is that if you add up the two elements, there are only really two Latin American economies that have really diversified into manufacturers, which are Mexico and Costa Rica. All, in all the others, uh, uh, you know, natural resource-based uh, products continue uh, to dominate uh, exports. Now, this, uh, 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 I mean, in some cases, they are, you know, more sophisticated. You know, you see here, this is Chile. So th this means that the, this area here, which is the manufacturers based on natural resources, are important. Now, here is Peru, which is another success story in terms of the diversification into natural resource-based manufacturers. Uh, agri-industry, you know, some mineral uh, products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the question here, and, and I, I leave this uh, uh, final remark, uh, uh, which has been a, a source of a heated debate in, in, uh, in Latin America for some time, is relates, I think, to the weight of two factors. By, by historical standards, uh, it is quite clear that developing countries that have grown very fast uh, our country that have diversified into manufacturers, and particularly into technology-intensive manufacturers. And that's the story of East Asia, is the current story of China. So all the countries, developing countries that grow very fast, generally do it uh, based on uh, diversification into you know, technology-intensive manufacturers. So by that standards, this story, uh, specializing in natural resources, 
is probably not uh, the, uh, the best uh, uh, bet. On the other hand, uh, you saw the uh, story of commodity prices, and, uh, and there are no signs uh, no, uh, that the that the boom in commodities is, uh, is coming to an end. Uh, essentially because uh, that commodity boom is essentially uh, f uh, fed by, by the, uh, the, the uh, imports of China, uh, and, uh, and China continues to grow at you know, close to 10 percent per year. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it is a, an important question. My, I would say uh, Latin America has probably underinvested uh, in technology and, and in technology intensive manufacturers, uh, but uh, of course the opportunities that have opened up uh, in terms of natural resources uh, uh, really have created a new opportunity uh, on which many developing countries are benefiting now. I mean, the fact that developing countries as a whole have done much, much better than industrial countries in recent years, including Latin America, uh, uh, but also including Africa, uh, it's a demonstration that, you know, that there may be, uh, that actually Chinese-led international growth has, had, has made a difference for developing countries that are rich in natural resources. Uh, while the opportunities uh, of, of a, let's say, of a world economy uh, led by the United States had, a, through time, closed the opportunity for natural resources uh, to be a, a basis of very rapid growth. So it's a question mark uh, whether uh, we are in the new world in this regard or not. Thank you. I want you to talk a little bit more about the uh, improvement in income distribution and what exactly is it based on? Um, I forgot to include one graph, um, but then Oh, excuse me, I, I forgot. I'm trying to find out the, the one on employment. But here, uh, I mean, uh, it's, a, you know, it's an important question mark. I mean, one interpretation uh, is that, uh, that you hear a lot in Latin America is that social policy has become wiser and somehow we're a bit better able, particularly with these uh, new programs of uh, targeted expenditure, this uh, conditional transfer they are called in the, uh, which is these programs that were uh, basically developed by uh, uh, Mexico and, um, and Brazil simultaneously more or less, uh, which is a, a transfer to the very poor um, a, of fiscal resources, which is conditional on, a, on, on their bringing a children to school a, and a, a, in the case of pregnant mothers to go to the uh, medical checkups. You know, it's a, it's a very important innovation which has been generalized throughout the region. I, I find that that, that explanation is uh, is not rely, you know, it's not very good, uh, essentially because uh, at the end, you know, the re the fiscal resources. I mean, the cost of these programs is very small, and we're talking about you know 0.3, percent of GDP. So it's uh, actually the, one of the advantages of these programs is they have a huge impact with very little money. I think that's actually the one of the. And, Aside from the fact that they are fairly efficient and, and, uh, and have a, a strong uh, impact on the very poor, so I, I really think that conditions in labor markets uh, is what is making the difference. Uh, but be, uh, there is another component of a graph which I failed to include here, uh, which is actually quite interesting, uh, which is uh, uh, the uh, uh, the effects of the, of the demographic uh, uh, transition. Now, uh, the demographic transition um, that Latin America started to experience in the 1960s uh, is a, a long-term process which has several phases. Uh, in the first phase of that process, what happened is that fertility goes down, um, so the rate of population growth starts to decline. Uh, but of course, the, the cohorts that enter into the labor market, which are 15 years or older, continue to grow very fast for some time, and 
the reduction in fertility allows women uh, to participate more actively in labor markets. So the result of, the, of that phase of the demographic transition is actually that you increase the supply of labor. Okay? Uh, and that was the phenomenon that went up from the 1970s to the 1990s. Very rapid growth in the supply of labor. Okay? Uh, and I'm talking here about you know, rates of, uh, of over 3% per year. Uh, still in the 1990s, uh, labor force growth was uh, over 3%. In, the ninth, in, the, in this decade, we have had the, 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 the fact that you know, the participation uh, rates of women in labor markets are already very high. And uh, the, uh, the, the growth of the new labor force, I mean, the people who are becoming 15, uh, you know, who were born, let's say, you know, in, in the 1990s, excuse me, the 1980s, no, 1990s. No, 1980s. <laughs> in the 1980s, uh, already uh, correspond to population that had slowed down significantly. Okay, so the rates of of uh, of, uh, 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 of increasing the labor supply have come down from more than three percent that they were for three decades uh, to two percent. So we have a coincidence during the recent boom. Uh, of a, a significant reduction uh, in the amount of uh, people that go into the labor market uh, with a, a significant increase in demand generated by the boom. So labor market conditions have started to improve very rapidly. I, I sense that this is probably the basic reason uh, for what is going on. It still is it's too early to, to say anything. I mean, uh, the, uh, one of the problems with the, the statistics on income distribution is that they uh, sometimes change, uh, you know, and you don't know how stable that improvement or deterioration is. I mean, for a long time we were uh, speculating about the deterioration that took place in the 1990s. Uh, now with, you know, full information for the whole period, uh, it, uh, it shows that the deterioration was much less uh, remarkable than we thought at the time. Uh, but I, I sense that it is conditions in labor markets that uh, are, have made a difference. So to put it uh, in, a simple, in simple terms, labor, labor was extremely abundant in Latin America for several decades. Now it's becoming scarce. And I think this is a big difference. By the way, this probably has also to do with... Uh, with uh, uh, the debate on immigration in the United States, okay? So maybe we're going into a period in which uh, migration flows uh, uh, will actually become uh, lower because the supply is lower. Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to know what are the percentage and uh, what countries spent their new gained uh, money on education? Well, uh, you know, one, uh, one thing that is clear in, in all of Latin America is that social spending, education and health in particular, increase uh, uh, in all countries uh, in, with the return to democracy. So in the 1990s, uh, uh, but it's, it's still in this decade, there was a, a continuous improvement uh, in the levels of social spending in all countries. And what is particularly interesting is that the countries that were lagging behind are the ones that have increased the spending uh, more. No, no I, didn't, I didn't bring figures of that. Uh, basically because that, that, that's a, a, something that took place actually earlier, uh, uh, since the 1990s. Uh, uh, now, the levels of spending uh, differ significantly by countries uh, in education as well as health and other uh, sectors. I mean, the, the average uh, Latin American country uh, it spends uh, today about 15% of GDP in the social sectors, uh, which is actually not a low figure. It's actually a relatively uh, a good figure. Uh, and it's, it's a, you know, a significant discussion. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a significant under underspending in certain things, particularly, for instance, pensions, uh, because the, the pension systems are highly underdeveloped, except in a few countries. Uh, but education and health, uh, have actually been two areas where the, there has been a lot of uh, increase in the spending. Uh, and the results are there actually uh, 
Again, this is something that uh, is not generally recognized, but I have written about it in, in other, you know, made presentations are, are, you know, about the issue, which is actually that when you compare Latin America uh, with other areas of the developing world, actually our standards of education and health uh, tend to be uh, relatively good. Uh, they are, of course, uh, not good if you compare, for instance, with the uh, rates of improvement in uh, South Korea or, okay, or, or Singapore. I mean, the really, uh, truly outstanding success stories. Uh, but, you know, you compare with the average of East Asia even, or North Africa, which are the two comparable regions in terms of levels of development, uh, you actually find that Latin America is slightly better in most indicators. Um, I mean, with a few exceptions, actually maternal mortality is, for instance, an exception. Uh, in uh, several Latin American countries, maternal mortality is very high, but, uh, you know, child mortality or uh, secondary schooling, for instance, uh, uh, or the proportion of people of, of birth that are attended by medical uh, personnel, uh, all those, uh, you know, statistics are better in Latin America on average than in East Asia or, or North Africa. So actually, the, uh, the Latin America, uh, uh, I would say that's not the, curiously enough, uh, the, the major problem. Uh, I mean, there are many things that you can do, particularly, I mean, there are terrible indicators, for instance, uh, maybe the quality of education. There has been a lot of discussion in recent years about the issue of the quality of education, uh, because the, uh, in, in this PISA uh, 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 tests that, you know, compare educational achievements uh, across countries, uh, you know, the Latin American countries which are, are included are generally come very bad. Um, in, in, but, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's an important question about the quality, and, and, and there's a lot of debate, particularly in countries that even have relatively high levels of, you know, development in the region. I mean, for instance, Chile, uh, in the PISA test uh, in education, come, come very bad. Uh, so that uh, it's a good question why, you know, how you can, you know, really uh, introduce improvements in education. Yes, please. Um, is uh, these trends likely to withstand or are they immune to some of the traditional political instabilities and volatilities in the South American area? The, the, the trending booms, the, uh, they seem to have been immune to a lot of the uh, political uh, uh, cataclysms that uh, befell uh, many of the Latin American countries, South American countries. I mean, for instance, I was surprised how rapidly Colombia and Ecuador and Venezuela <coughs> a few weeks ago came to a flashpoint that, you know, they, it seemed at least that they were close to war, and I don't know how really close they were, but uh, are these uh, economic trends now sophisticated enough that they're immune <coughs> to these political uh, volatilities? Well, it depends on what political volatility. Being from Colombia, you know, for a long time, I, I sense that you know we have continued to grow for a long period despite uh, uh, our relatively high levels of violence. Um, uh, but you know, political instability in the uh, in the strong sense of the term, when you have uh, you know, huge political instability, generally uh, uh, growth is affected. Um, now. Uh, so it's, it's a good question. I mean, uh, let's say among the, the countries of Latin America, uh, you know, that have the strongest leftward swing, uh, you know, Venezuela is growing very rapidly. But uh, it's growing very rapidly on, on the basis of, uh, of a, you know, a very rapid expansion in public sector spending, uh, which is in, in turn financed by the oil boom. So in that case, I, I, uh, with very, very major problems now, you know, it has the highest rate of inflation in Latin America. The price controls have generated uh, significant distortions. Uh, so I, you know, that's, but it, again, it has, an economy has been growing very rapidly. Uh, this is not true of Ecuador or Bolivia. Uh, actually, the two economies are, uh, are not doing very well, despite uh, being, uh, let's say, uh, uh, exporters of uh, oil and gas. Um, uh, so uh, now the other countries, uh, you can say Uruguay or Argentina, uh, which are more modern left-wing governments, they have been doing very well uh, in recent years. Uh, Brazil uh, has been doing less well, uh, but has uh, improved. 
Uh, last year, as I said, uh, it, well, last year it grew more than 5% uh, and is expected to continue. Uh, so I'm not totally sure that there is a, a clear association between political uh, movements. I mean, on the other hand, Mexico, which has, a, a, I guess, a clear uh, conservative government, uh, is one of the poorest performers and is expected to continue to be a poor performer. Uh, so it's a good question what happened uh, with Mexico. And I think it's a <coughs> Mexico has clearly benefited from, from NAFTA with you know, very rapid turn, uh, growth of exports, uh, very high levels of uh, investment, foreign investment, but doesn't grow. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, it's a, it's a debate. I, I, I mean, we could can get to that. Well, one more question. Yes. I wondered if I could ask you to broaden your scope to your former global view. What is your prognosis for the success or challenges still for the Millennium Development Goals uh, worldwide, <coughs> considering the volatility in current markets? Uh, well, uh, the uh, uh, my answer would be the following. Um, uh, which actually is, is not unlike the story of Latin America uh, for the reasons that I would mention. But in general, uh, this current boom that the developing world has experienced has been extremely good, um, uh, combined in some cases with other factors. For instance, uh, I think the rising aid to Africa uh, is finally having an effect on, on several indicators. So the mix of aid with, uh, with good economic conditions for growth uh, has actually been quite good for the developing world and for the Millennium Development Goals. I mean, you can see in Latin America, for instance, uh, all the analysis um, uh, seem to indicate that Latin America will reach, let's say, those Millennium Development Goals that were associated to public sector spending, for instance, health or education targets, okay? Uh, but was not going to achieve those that were more dependent on economic conditions, such as poverty rates. Okay? Uh, now it looks like Latin America will meet all of those targets. Now, uh, uh, it will not meet others. Uh, uh, the environmental targets uh, in general, where it's a deforestation, uh, it continues to be a major problem. But, uh, but the education, I mean, the social sort of indicators uh, have been doing, you know, Latin America has been doing very well. Uh, Africa, I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, uh, will most probably not meet uh, many of the, uh, of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, essentially because it started too late. Uh, but the trends now are very positive uh, in general. Uh, with, I guess, a lot of diversity within Africa. So that, but the country that have been doing well uh, in, uh, in terms of economic growth and, uh, and social spending uh, uh, actually uh, uh, are, you know, showing very rapid improvements in some of the uh, Millennium Development Goals. So uh, actually the scenario uh, is optimistic. I mean, one good question that relates actually to the last question that I, I asked uh, is whether uh, really the, uh, first of all, whether the, uh, this uh, new engine of the world economy, which is China, uh, I mean, we were living in a, in a world in, uh, in recent decades in which the U.S. was the essential engine of the, uh, of the world economy. But now, you know, we have had two engines in recent years, and we are losing one. Uh, but the other, China, is, um, uh, is doing... Uh, very well so far. I mean, nobody can bet that it, uh, that it can continue to grow at 8 to 10 percent per year, but it looks like so far that it's possible uh, that it continue to grow that fast. And if that happens, uh, actually the spillovers on, on uh, other developing countries uh, are quite impressive uh, because it's basically, uh, you know, keeping commodity prices high commodity prices high are good for you know most of the developing world uh, and huh? yeah, well the food the food was too cheap <laughs> no that's what my graphs show 
that one of the problems is actually that the culture, uh, cultural prices were very low. Actually, you know, most of the poor in the developing world are, are, are rural producers. So they must be benefited somehow. I mean, maybe the urban poor uh, have, you know, are probably facing more problems with, the, with higher cultural prices. But actually for the rural poor, this, this uh, is actually good. Um, uh, I mean, the cultural prices were too low. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you, you can say, you know, in my graphs, actually, what, what it shows is that tropical agricultural goods are still very cheap. Uh, I mean, coffee, <laughs> uh, being uh, perhaps one of the important commodities there, you know, coffee continues to be very cheap uh, relative to, uh, to historical, and, you know, higher coffee prices will do a lot of good for many developing countries. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, uh, I think the you know high commodity prices are, have been you know are very good. They are very good for Africa. <laughs> they are certainly good for Latin America, and, and they are good for uh, some of the you know Southeast Asian countries that are also agricultural exporters. Uh, so the you know that is um, uh, actually if if we were able. Under this conjuncture, to uh, to agree on the reduction of food uh, of uh, uh, agricultural subsidies in industrial countries, which is something that should be easy to do, you know, in, uh, uh, under these conditions, uh, actually, you know, the situation will be even better. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and, and then on top of, of that, uh, China as as. Uh, uh, the, I, there was this, the issue of the economists and the new colonialists, uh, you know, who show that you know the very massive investments that China is making uh, in Africa, um, uh, most as actually as what the U.S. or Europe uh, did in the other parts of the developing world in the you know late 19 and you know and throughout the 20th century, which was uh, largely to develop the natural resources, uh, and uh, actually you know that combination of you know high commodity prices and large investments uh, actually could be uh, you know good you know whether it will last enough to uh, and China will not get into trouble is, is another question and you know one of the major discussions going on uh, currently is whether you know the US uh, first of all how hard this uh, US crisis will be uh, on the real economy on the financial is clear that it's very strong uh, the crisis, but on the real side, you know, it's a still a question mark whether you know this how let's say how strong and, and lengthy the recession will be. Uh, it's, a, it's a question, but also uh, whether you know there is you know in, in the debate the words that are used now in the debate whether there is a de decoupling uh, of the rest of the world from the U.S. economy so that the rest of the world could continue to grow fast despite the U.S. Uh, economy uh, entering into a, a period of difficulties. My own sense is that, you know, the over-optimists in that regard are wrong, that the U.S. economy is too important not to matter for the rest of the world, uh, but that China, is, uh, China has a lot of room to continue growing very fast, uh, among other reasons because it has current account surplus, a very good fiscal position, so it could actually replace foreign markets by domestic markets. And, uh, and that uh, uh, will have facilitate uh, 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 China being uh, continue to be a, a, a good engine of growth for the world economy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.